So today we um, will be discussing um, topics related to the uh, cold uh, rolling mill. This um, the cold mill usually also involves the in terms of the um, production, um, it's also associated with the annealing. And um, as we concentrate on um, strip for the technology, uh, the uh, description in this course will be talking about batch annealing and continuous annealing. And um, there is also a temper rolling involved. The, um, for coded products, the, the route is slightly different um, and we'll, um, we'll discuss that in a separate um, lecture. Okay. So let's um, let's get started here. So uh, what do we uh, get out of uh, or produce in a cold strip mill? Uh, we obtain a strip that uh, has the right exit thickness and the right shape, hmm? flatness, hmm? and profile. Hmm? And it must be defect free. Hmm? And uh, after the cold strip mail, the coils, as I said, will be annealed, batch annealed, or continuous annealed, or they can go to a separate uh, coating line, mm -hmm. uh, which is usually a separate entity uh, to be electro-galvanized, hot dip galvanized, etc. The material, the way it's put on the uh, market will will be temper rolled. Yes, it means it's um, it's given a final uh, cold rolling step after the coating or after the annealing to achieve a number of um, uh, strip characteristics. In particular, the a particular roughness on the applies a particular roughness on the surface of the strip. And the, uh, as I said, um, in addition to being electro-galvanized or galvanized, the, the strip can, in addition, then go through a, uh, an additional coating um, process whereby a paint layer is applied. And, um, and this may involve actually two paint layers, a primer, and a top coat. Again, these are usually uh, separate production plants. Yeah. Okay, so we'll be talking about uh, the different um, technologies and designs for these uh, the cold strip mills, mm -hmm. um, and we'll also uh, talk uh, a little bit more detail about lubrication in the cold strip mill because that's really very important. Okay. Good. So uh, basically, in the cold uh, rolling, we we get the strip with the right exit thickness. Yes. The material is heavily cold deformed, so it cannot be used in practice. So you need to anneal it in a continuous annealing line or a batch annealing line. After that, after this annealing, the material can be electro galvanized or you can do both the annealing and the galvanizing in a hot dip galvanizing line. So this, these lines, the HDG lines, you actually make, you recrystallize the steel and you, um, you galvanize the steel. And eventually you get a cold rolled uh, galvanized or not galvanized coil. Okay. So the cold strip mill traditionally uh, will consist of a 
decoiler, a number of stands, um, and a, t uh, a coiler unit. Hmm? Nowadays, uh, as if you remember uh, from the discussion, uh, the presentation on the pickling lines, nowadays um, there is a, the, the units are usually built so that you have continuous operation which involves the, the pickling line and the cold rolling. So the, the exit of the pickling line goes straight into the cold rolling. So usually, usually modern uh, cold strip mills are very highly automated and there's really not much to see in the exterior of, this, this, uh, of the line. Um, it's usually the, the, the mill stands are not visible uh, and, um, and, and, and what you see here are the, uh, the work rolls that are ready for, uh, uh, to replace the worn out work rolls. Okay. Okay. So this is an example here. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, you get lots of six high stands. Yes, to get perfect strip uh, control, strip um, profile control. I'll say a few words about this, and, and we'll have a separate lecture on it also. Um, so these are these um, uh, stands. And then we usually have two coilers, yes? And these are what we call exit tension reels or exit tension uh, coilers. So that means you can apply a tension on the out exit uh, strip. And you remember why we do this? It's because it has a big impact on the, um, the friction peak in, um, in rolling. Okay. Right, so um, these uh, coilers, why do we have two coilers? That's because uh, you can, uh, while you are uh, coiling one, uh, using one of the coilers to coil, you have the other coil is being unloaded. Yes? And uh, you, there may also be uh, a shear to, uh, to cut the, uh, the strip to uh, the right uh, length. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, these coilers, is, as they are presented here, have, are uh, separate uh, units. You also have uh, coilers which, where you have a drum, a big drum, with two mandrels, yes, and you have uh, one mandrel is in a position to, for coiling and the other uh, mandrel is in a position for unloading. Hmm? So there, there are different ways in which this can be done. Now, you'd not all, you don't always have tandem coil rolling. You can have single stand cold rolling units. Hmm? Uh, in particular, if you visit uh, stainless steel mills, very often uh, they will have single stand reversing mills for the cold rolling. This is an example here of a uh, six high um, cold mill, a single stand hmm, with a, an exit tension reel. So you can apply tension on the exit but it's only got a payoff reel. So payoff reel is just a, a, um, a uh, you unwrap the, uh, the strip here, hmm? uh, and there's no tension. This, this unit cannot apply any tension. Hmm? So in this particular case, hmm, this, this type of setup is for situations where the, the coils are loaded, Mm, they're rolled once, coiled on the other side, yes, and then removed. And this is a non-reversing situation. Mm. So that's when you only uh, do one uh, pass. What you, uh, you don't see this mo uh, more um, often. What, what you often see uh, are uh, 
single stand cold rolling uh, mills where you have a reversing mill. Yeah? So the, the strip passes through the same uh, mill back and forth a few times, as many times as you need to achieve a final thickness. And it does this, yes, um, in the following way. So you have a payoff reel that allows you to load the strip into the, uh, the mill, yes, yes. and then uh, once you have put the, st the strip on one of the tension reels, then you pass it through and you attach it to an entry tension reel also. So the strip passes through the, uh, the mill with forward and backward tension, yes? Okay, so how does this work? So you start here on the, on the right hand side, yes? Um, so you, you arrive with the uh, hot uh, rolled coils, yes? And, and you have two coilers here. The first coil, coiler is a payoff rail. So this, here it just, you just unwrap the uh, the, uh, the hot rolled pickled coil and then you pass it through the, the mill and then you, uh, you pick it up here, yes, on this tension reel, all right? Now, the strip here will eventually come off, come off the, uh, the mandrel, right? And you don't want it to flap around and you want it to, there should be some tension on the strip. So you have a strip press, yes, that will keep, give you some uh, uh, tension by friction, yes, and also prevents the strip from moving around, yes? Okay, okay. All right, so then most of this, the strip is now here, yes, and this end part here is now put on the tension reel here, yes? So it puts here, and you start rolling, yes? So this is, so this is the first pass, this is the second pass, yes? Okay, so you can do even number of passes or uneven number of passes, okay? So if you do an, un, uh, an even number of passes, one, two, the, the coil ends up here. You have to unload it from here. Or if you do an uneven, odd number of passes, the coil will be here, yes? Okay. Now, remember that when you go back and forth, yes, you always keep the end parts, the end parts here of the strip on the mandrel. So they never get rolled. Okay, so if they don't get rolled, they remain thick, yes? So you have to get rid of these ends, yes, that didn't get rolled, yes? So what you do here is uh, you cut it. For instance, in this case, you can see here you, um, you will take out uh, this uh, coil, so you you come here, yeah, you cut the end, and then you go back and you roll up what's left, yes? So here you get a small piece of coil, yes, small piece of coil that is, has the, that's off thickness, right? And you call this a pup coil, yes? And on this side, of course, the central part of the coil will be off gauge, will not have the right thickness, okay? So this, this, this odd number of passes is what you see is most common. You get off se uh, uh, gauge sec uh, sections are, uh, remain inside and the outside off gauge section makes a pup coil, yes? So these, are, these are pup coils. These are these small coils that are off gauge 
and this is a puppy. It's the same pup. Okay? So that means it's because there's the pup coils, like you call them pup coils because they're small and cute, like this dog. Okay? Uh, okay, so, and, and that's very common, these um, reversing mills. Yes? And you produce uh, pup coils and you, then you sell the pup coils also to smaller companies that can do something with them. Um, what you also have are mill stands where um, you don't have one um, uh, stand, but you have two stands, yes? And so, uh, for instance, here you have a, a situation where you have four high uh, stands. You have two of them, yes? And you have two tension reels, so that means you can do twice the number of reductions per pass. Yeah? So it has a higher productivity. Hmm? But it's basically a reversing mill also. Hmm? You can just do more, uh, you can produce uh, faster. And of course, because you have two stands, it's going to be a more expensive mill. Hmm? There are also um, uh, double cold rolling mills, like they, but that are different, yes? And they're not reversing mills, and they're used to uh, make tin plate. And tin plate is uh, a product with, with which you make, it's packaging steel, yes? And these, uh, uh, they're non-reversing, so you only go, you pass once through, the, through this uh, mill, so you, have, you only need a payoff reel, no tension, yes? And a tension reel where you wrap up the, the strip after the rolling. And so um, usually you have two stands. You have a reduction stand and then a surface conditioning stand that basically gives the right surface roughness to the strip. Hmm? Okay, and this is the same... Uh, uh, situation here, you have a reduction stand and a, a surface um, treatment stand um, in succession here. Hmm? And it's for, um, as I said, uh, tin plate um, production. We said a few things about uh, gauge control in when we discussed the, the hot strip mill. Yes. I just um, want to say a few things at this point, at this juncture about the tandem mill. Hmm? So in a tandem mill, you have the strip goes from one uh, stand into the other stand. Yes, and the what you have to uh, do in order to have stable rolling, you have to have a constant mass flow through the mill. That means what does that mean? It means that the whatever the mass that comes in has to go out. Yes exactly the same value. Otherwise, if the value that comes out is higher than what comes in, there will be a rupture. Or if uh, the, uh, the value that comes out is lower than what you put in, uh, you will have a cobble, yes? You will have, okay. So what does that mean, this constant mass flow? Is that the product of the velocity of the strip out times the thickness of the strip should be equal to the velocity in and the thickness in of the next um, um, of the next uh, stand. Hmm? So if I have the speed exit after uh, the exit speed after um, the first 
uh, mill, the mill first stand, excuse me, is V1 and thickness H1. Then the mass flow out of V1, uh, out of the um, uh, first stand is V1 H1, V2 H2 after the second one, etc. V5 H5. So the constant mass flow requirements means that V1 H1 should be to V5 times H5. And of course, H1 is the entry thickness, and H5 is the required exit thickness. So th the thickness might the actual gauge that's re needed. So the mass flow or uh, the volume flow out of each stand is the product of the gauge, yes, uh, times the strip out of each stand. So if, if there is an error yes, of gauge here, yes, it will always propagate through the mill. Yes, through the mill. Hmm? Say so if we have a constant uh, uh, mass flow out of uh, V1, uh, out of um, 1, uh, stand 1, and say uh, we have an exit uh, gauge error, hmm? we can exit here, right? We can correct it by changing the speed. Yes? Because if, if there's differences between, so, sorry, if you have to correct for H, yes, you can do this by changing the velocities, yes, yes. And so this brings in a new um, concept of gauge control in the cold strip mill, and that is gauge control with via speed. Yes, and it's based on basically this here. Yeah? So the way to control uh, the um, uh, the thickness is with speed. Right. So again, here, just as in the case of the hot strip mill, yes, the gauge control, yes, is achieved by actuators, and we have mechanical screw down actuators and hydraulic capsules yes and we know we already discussed this mechanical screw downs are have a slow response and the hydraulics are fast responders yes okay so um, how does it work uh, the, you you remember that hydraulic gap control is done by controlling the pressure in the uh, hydraulic capsules yes um, right, and you put the pressure on the uh, backup roll chuck, yes? All right. Um, or it can be electromechanical screw down, and that means that then you have a motor, yes, and then via a, mo uh, sorry, a gear box and screw and nut um, geometry, you can apply pressure, yes, and uh, increase or decrease the gap uh, by applying pressure on the backup roll chuck, yes. In most, as I, I had um, said, in most of the modern mills, yes, we will also have the possibility to improve the strip profile. That's the cross-sectional, remember, that's the cross-sectional shape of the strip. Mm -hmm. And that is done, for instance, in this case, by bending, by roll bending capsules, yes? And then here, for instance, you have, cap so that means that you have little uh, hydraulic capsules here that can bend the roll, mm -hmm. so you achieve the right roll profile, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, in addition to this, you can also have lateral roll shifting, yes? And you see the, the rolls here are asymmetric, yes? And it allows you to do some additional types of bending, which, which we'll discuss in more detail, yes? Or uh, later on, hmm, to achieve the right strip profile. Hmm? So that's the cross-sectional shape of the strip. 
and you can have um, lateral roll shifting or you can even have cross bear rolls yes okay so all these things are very common in modern cold uh, uh, rolling uh, mills in addition because we're working at low temperature we can do a lot more inline uh, measurements on the strip we can um, so uh, standard uh, cold rolling mist it will have uh, thickness gauges which can be x-ray gauges or isotope gauges or even contact gauges <coughs> uh, although the contact gauges are only suitable when you have low strip speeds you have tension control uh, can uh, also is also available and of course you you measure the force with load cells and you also have strip velocity measurements yes okay again we'll talk about this in more detail later on when we uh, when we talk about uh, strip profile let's um, go back to um, some uh, data about the um, cold rolling mill how um, what are typical uh, cold rolling mill parameters well if you um, in terms look in terms of the reduction yes the a, um, a cold strip mill will typically produce material that's less than two millimeters thick hmm? and so you can see here if the reduction if the the strip is about 0.8 millimeters yes depending on the type of steel you're processing ddq meaning deep drawing quality deep drawing quality that will be batch annealed that will be continuous annealed a carbon manganese structural steel or niobium hsla steel the reductions are typically of the order of 75 percent okay for a width here of 1250 the number of mill stands is four to five nowadays it can be different um, it can be more like five or six perhaps hmm? the thickness that a cold rolling mill can take in is typically maximum as a maximum around five to six millimeters yes and the thickness out uh, you can see here about 0.2 millimeters yes minimum so the maximum reductions that we can give are 80 percent 90 percent these are very high reductions usually usually a cold uh, strip mill will operate at 70 75 percent the very high reductions are given to strip where we want to achieve texture control, very strong texture control. And there's also uh, usually uh, strip tension. Yeah? Okay? So remember that uh, when we did uh, discuss the rolling fundamentals, we saw that uh, what is very important in rolling is friction. And uh, we also uh, uh, describe the fact that in the uh, roll uh, gap, yes, the, um, there was a considerable flattening of the roll. Yes? So you have a elastic deformation of the roll surface and it's flattened it's strongly flattened and again there is forward slip yes um, and you have a shearing of the surface in the roll gap and remember this uh, plot here shows that if we decrease the friction we can decrease the rolling load yes now in the hot strip mill that was difficult to achieve this 
uh, reduction of friction through lubrication. But you can achieve it very easily in the cold strip mill. Yes? And so we're going to take some time to discuss lubrication in the cold strip mill. What are the functions of the lubrications? Well, number one, of course, most important is reduction of friction. So that because then you have a direct economic advantage and technical advantage is you reduce, you have considerable reduction of rolling forces. Yeah? And because of that, you also have a higher quality strip surface, yes? a better control of the strip profile, and a reduced work roll wear. So very important yes, uh, to have lubricants whenever you can. The um, additional benefit of the lubrication is cooling. Yes, you, Because you use, you use less um, uh, forces, less load, you will have um, less heating also. You'll have less heating of the roll because there's less friction, yes? Um, and the, the heating is caused by friction and by deformation, we know. Um, now, one of the things we could be using is water, yes? Because water is a very good coolant, yes? So we could use water. But water is a very poor lubricant. Yes, it's very poor lubricant. And so we will not be using water, uh, or not only water, in the lubricants for the cold strip mill. We use emulsions, dispersions, or stabilized dispersions. And emulsion um, is a, a product that typically contains a few percent of surfactant. We'll see that, what's that, what it is in a moment which limits the uh, breaking up of the oil particles yes, into a separate layer. Yes? And so it means we don't need to agitate, mix the emulsion, the water-oil mixture um, continuously to achieve, to make our lubricant. A dispersion, here we have added uh, surfactants, Yes, which forms a protective colloidal layer on surface of oil particles. Yes, again, the reason why we do this is to eliminate coalescent of the oil film. In dispersions, what's the big difference between dispersion and emulsion? Because it's rather similar, is the fact that you the distribution of particles, the control of the particle oil particle size is much narrower than in the case of an emulsion, yes? And in a dispersion, the oil layer will tend to split off, yes? And so you need to keep a dispersion um, well dispersed, yes? By um, keeping it, uh, by agitating it, by mixing it, basically. And then you have stabilized dispersions which are a uh, newer system with some, something between emulsions and dispersion, but they don't need agitation. Now, these are the fact that you reduce friction and you reduce, and, and you, um, uh, the uh, lubricants also work as, as coolants, is positive. There is a negative about uh, lubricants. Lubricants are basically organic products and they will, uh, because of the very high uh, uh, pressures in the roll gap, they, c they are um, sensitive to um, uh, breakdown. And so lubrication will, can, will cause carbon deposits, yes, uh, which you will need to remove. Yes. Okay. And of course, you will also need to remove residues of lubricants on your strip. Okay. Okay. So let's have a look at 
the basics, some basics of the uh, oil water mixtures that we call emulsions. Yes, so we add oil. Yes, and emulsifiers, and emulsifier is basically a molecule which has a hydrophilic end and a lipophilic end. So the lipophilic end is oil soluble and the water soluble or hydrophilic end is, is, uh, is water soluble. And so these uh, molecules will orient themselves this way. Yes? And this will stabilize our emulsion. Okay? Good. Now, the uh, if you ever work later in a hot strip mill, the um, uh, providers of lubricants are very specialized companies. Usually uh, they tend to be, it's a side product of petrochemical industry. So for instance, Texaco, Shell, uh, and others are big suppliers of lubricants. Yes, because it's a, it's a side product of the petroleum uh, industry. These are very complex chemistries, yes? So don't try to, by all by yourself, try to improve the chemistry or whatever, right? It's pretty complex. There are many chemicals going into, and, and what I'm going to tell you here is just the tip of the iceberg. But typically, uh, these lubricants can easily con contain, you know, 15, uh, chemical uh, in their compositions. Yeah? The major constituents are mineral oils, which we call mineral oils. You know, esters or mineral, they're major constituents. Yes? And so there's the base lubricants, and they are important in what we call elasto-hydrodynamic lubrication. So EHD is and I, um, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't, um, it's not included here, but EHD stands for Elasto-Hydrodynamic Lubrication. Hydrodynamic Lubrication. Or hydro, the, the D stands for hydrodynamic. Um, then you have additional uh, important compounds. You have fatty acids, yes. They are important in boundary lubrication. Boundary lubrication is when uh, the two surfaces, the strip surface and the roll surface, for instance, are in physical contact, in strong physical contact. Yeah. You also have antioxidants that will protect the lubricant from oxidation, polymerization, in, in other words, degradation over time. Um, we have emulsifiers, of course, to, uh, to, that we add so we can mix the oil and water mixtures. And then we also have phosphorus and sulfur containing additives. And those are not um, uh, uh, organic molecules. They tend to, they're added to form very strong films, yes, at the surface, yes. And the phosphorus containing additives form films that can easily, you know, uh, very thin films that can easily be sheared, yes? And the sulfur-containing additives are very resistant to high pressures, yes? And they prevent welding, yes? Cold welding, uh, is, uh, I mean with uh, this, uh, we'll see where the cold welding occurs. So let's have a look at um, two surfaces, two technical surfaces. So technical surfaces of all kinds are never atomically smooth, yes? They, they have a certain roughness and waviness. Hmm? 
at the, at the surface. So um, let's have a look now at metal to metal contact. There is, let's say there's no oil, right? Yeah. Um, so we call this dry lubrication. There's, there's no lubricant, it's just dry. Hmm? And so this kind of lubrication is also called boundary lubrication, hmm? when there is little or no lubricant. Hmm? So what happens if I bring these two surfaces together? Well, the, the hills, the, 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 excuse me, the, the tops of the surface profiles will make contact, yes? And if I uh, press them together, yes, uh, these uh, tops here, these asperities, will be squeezed, yes? And if I squeeze hard enough, I may even cold weld them to each other. Yeah? And in the case I have a little bit of lubricant, yes, there will be pockets of lubricants. Yeah? Pockets of lubricant. So in what we call boundary lubrication, yes, I have tiny pockets of lubricants and then I have asperities that are flattened and there may be cold welding on these uh, surfaces. Hmm? All right. So what kind of situations do we have now? If the two surfaces move relative to each other, yes? Well, if we have, say, a hard asperity, a hard top, or we have a, a hard surface, like a roll surface is hard, and we, can, we have a soft strip surface, yes, we can get scratching, plowing of the soft surface by a hard asperity. Yeah? Or uh, we can have bonding. Yeah? They, can, they can cold weld. And then when the surfaces move away from each other, you can have breakage of that, that bond. Yes? And that process, these two first processes, um, give rise to what we call iron fines. Iron fines is, are typically found on, on uh, cold deformed products and they're very fine iron particles. They come from these processes. Yes? If we have yes, a, an oil film in between these processes can be avoided, yes? Because now the deformation is what we call is viscous drag, yes? And this is basically when, when the two uh, surfaces move with respect to each other, we are not uh, making uh, bonding, we're not plowing the surfaces, but we're just shearing, shearing this lubricant film, okay? Okay. So let's have a look at this shearing process. Yes, the shearing process. Okay. The shearing process of, an, of oil is determined by its viscosity. And the viscosity is equal to the shear stress divided by the shear rate. Yes. Okay, so if I have a high, high viscosity uh, material, uh, high viscosity oil, I will need a high, high shear stress to achieve the same shear rate. Yes. Okay. Now, so the viscosity is an important parameter. It's the main parameter of uh, the lubricant in, in, from a mechanical point of view, yes, and it's very much pressure and temperature dependence. Well, we are all familiar with the temperature dependence. We know that if you have an oil, yes, um, and you warm it up, it will become thinner. It will lose its viscosity. So the viscosity decreases with increasing temperature. What we usually do not know uh, from experience is the fact that with pressure, the viscosity increases. Yeah? 
All right? And of course, why is this so important? It's so important because in rolling, we have very high pressures. Yes? Okay, now let's have a look at um, the pressure influence, the influence of pressure on viscosity. So let's look at water first. And we increase the pressure. Hmm? Uh, say here from 0.1 megapascal to 1 gigapascal. You see that water, the viscosity doesn't change very much. Yes, it goes from 1 to a little bit less than 2. Yes. Uh, by the way, the, the, uh, uh, viscosity is in, centi, in centipoise. It's, um, so it's, 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 it's pascals times seconds. Yes. Um, and, uh, but with mineral oils, yes, of course, we start with a, uh, uh, a lubricant that's, that's a lot more viscous than water. But as you increase, you get a dramatic, huge increase in the viscosity. Yeah? Not just a little bit, not just doubling, but you know, a very, very large increase in the uh, viscosity. Yeah? Okay? So in a mill, the viscosity is much, much higher than the one you feel with your fingers, okay? Because of these very high pressures. Okay? All right. Now, with lubrication, hmm, um, there are many parameters, yes? Well, let's just look at our, the process of rolling. Yes. What we know that um, locally there will be a pressure. Yes. We also know that there will be a relative velocity. Yes. The strip will is, is never at the same velocity. Yes. As the roll surface. Yes. So there is a relative velocity, and then the lubricant has a certain um, viscosity, yes? So how is it possible to um, uh, talk in a simple manner about uh, lubrication, taking into account all these parameters? Yeah? Well, yes, it just turns out that you can plot a master curve for a lubricant, yes, where you uh, get, uh, so on the y-axis, you get the coefficient of friction, mu, uh, which is the shear stress divided by pressure. So you, you know what uh, friction is, is if you, if you have two surfaces, yes, and they're under and you, you, their pressure, right, the, the friction coefficient is the, is the ratio of the shear stress to the, pr the applied pressure, yes, okay, and you want, so, so a, when a lubricant works well, yes, the friction coefficient will be low hmm? because the, the shear stress to get the thing moving will be lower, okay? Okay. So, uh, well, so in the y-axis, you do sp speed times viscosity divided by the pressure. And this, is a, this parameter, yes, allows you to draw a single curve for the friction coefficient, and it looks like this. This is what it looks like. So, when this parameter has a low value, I have high friction. Yes? When this parameter has a high value, I have low friction. 
So let's first look at pressure. Yeah? So if I have a high pressure, yes, the velocity and the lubricant, the, uh, lubricant um, viscosity being the same, yes, an increase in P means that I'm on this side. So when P increases, I'm on the, yes, I'm, so I have high friction conditions. Yeah? If I have um, a high velocity, yes, then I'm going this way, yes. I will get a reduction in um, friction, all other things being the same. The, the viscosity of my lubricant and the pressure uh, being the same. Why is it that this happens? Well, the reason is very simple. It's because something happens to the lubricant film thickness. The lubricant film thickness goes like this. So, and what happens? Well, it's shown here, yes? When this parameter here, yes? By the way, this curve is called the Strebeck curve. Yes. Um, so, so when when this parameter is small, you have metal to metal contacts, and you have dry lubrication conditions, so high friction condition. Yes. And typically, the friction coefficient is then between 0.1 to 1. Yeah? As this parameter increases because you've increased the viscosity or you've increasing the speed or you're decreasing the pressure, yeah? you have, you creating lubricant pockets. Lubricant pockets. You can see the thickness of the film increases. Yes. And you get a situation that's called mixed lubrication. Yes. The minimum is reached when we have so-called elastohydrodynamic lubrications where you have a large number of lubricant pockets. And uh, the hydrodynamic lubrication is the case uh, here when, when you uh, thickness of the film is such that the two surfaces are separate, separated, yes? And uh, the friction is then a function of the, the, the properties of the lubricant only. Okay? Right. So when, when are we um, in the right uh, working conditions? Hmm? So we know we'd, we'd like to avoid boundary type lubrication, and we'd like to have elastohydrodynamic lubrication with low friction. So um, what the, the situation will depend on the roughness of the, the combined roughnesses of your, your surfaces, which in the case of rolling is the roll surface and the strip surface, and the lubricant film thickness. So when we have a, a roll, rolling situation, we have a work roll roughness, and is strip roughness, yes? And the combined roughness is taken as the square root of the roughness of the work roll squared times the strip roughness square. The lubricant film thickness we call H. So when H is about the same as this sigma, we have boundary uh, lubrication. If the uh, uh, film thickness is one to three times the combined roughness, then we are in mixed condition and we have the right electro, um, electro elasto hydrodynamic, uh, this is a typo here, EHD, elasto hydrodynamic lubrication, if the thickness is about three times the, uh, the combined roughness. Okay. This is kind of a picture here, so you have an idea of what happens. So at the inlet here, yes, uh, we have the um, 
the oil is entrapped yes between the work roll and the strip yes so in this contact area we have lubricant pockets and we may have places where the surface is in contact yes where they're touched touching so in the case of boundary lubrication I have very small these pockets are very small yes in the case of the uh, elasto hydrodynamic lubrication I have a lot more lubricant between the two surfaces and you get uh, in, in, in areas in many areas you get total separation of the surfaces right? now having said this uh, it's also important to realize that at the surface here yes um, because there is a relative movement between the surfaces um, this these contact places don't remain uh, like this yeah in, in particular these uh, uh, lubricant uh, pockets will become undeeper and f they will flatten out yes yes and also the surface will be stretched like this okay so the this, this shape doesn't stay like this hmm? Hmm? so we get asperities that are crushed and there is um, plastic shear deformation at the surface and the process here of these asperities being deformed, yeah, being sheared off, leads to carbon fines. And uh, also these extreme uh, mechanical conditions here will also lead to uh, decomposition of these uh, mineral oils and you'll form um, uh, carbon residues, yes? which again, both of these things need to be reduced. Um, in the um, uh, roll gap itself, um, the the film thickness is pretty um, pretty flat because you the roll gap is actually very you know, because of the roll flattening is very flat. Yeah. Um, at the beginning, of course, we get the at, at the start at the entry. You have the 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 oil is is taken into the uh, roll gap and at the exit you get an interesting phenomenon is that the uh, the thickness of the oil is decreasing and we can we get a pressure peak which is called Petrusevich pressure peak and the reason why we have this pressure peak is because when the strip uh, leaves the roll gap there is an elastic, the, uh, the roll surface is now free, yes, it's free. And so it will elastically uh, bounce back, yes. It's been flattened very much, it's going to bounce back, yes. And so it will actually squeeze the oil film a little bit, and that gives us this uh, pressure peak. Hmm? All right, so um, very important, this um, e EHD, uh, elasto hydrodynamic lubrication hmm? and it's lubrication by a lubricant fill full lubricant fill in condition of elastic contact and high pressure hmm? Hmm? so this high pressure results in a very flat contact area and because of these high pressures your oil is very very viscous yes hmm? and there where you have uh, no contact between the two you have what we call uh, glide like uh, conditions yeah Sh and you you basically shear the oil film hmm? okay let's have a look now at the velocity the impact of the velocity what happens with the velocity um, so you can already see here yes that when I keep the uh, viscosity of the oil the same, I keep the pressure the same, I just increase the velocity, that means my oil film will increase in thickness. 
Okay? And you can measure this. It's a um, uh, rather complicated way uh, tests to do this, but it's possible to um, measure the film, the oil film thickness as a function of the velocity. Hmm? And you can do this for neat oils or you can do this for emulsions. When, when um, you talk about neat oils, that means you're not mixing it with water. You just use the pure oil as, as such, yes? Okay, so you can use neat oil or water plus oil emulsions. And uh, so you see that as you uh, increase the velocity, you get the, the thickness of the film increases. And you can see here uh, what type of thicknesses we're talking about, 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers. It's very thin films, yes? Um, and you also see the effect of the temperature. So the temperature increases. That means the uh, lubrication, lubric, um, the, uh, your um, viscosity decreases. And so there is a, a, a shift of this uh, line to the right. It's basically, you basically get a, a decrease in film thickness. Okay. Right. So, quite a complex thing happens when you uh, entrap the lubricant film in the uh, roll gap. So, so in the roll gap, the uh, uh, oil or the lubricant is sucked into the roll gap yes, and you get a what's called a phase inversion of the oil water emulsion yes and what actually happens is this oil water emulsion turns into a water oil emulsion yes you get a inversion of this thing here. The other thing that happens, yes, is that if we increase the speed too much, yes, there will not be enough, you need to, um, so the, the, the oil goes through the, oil, the, the roll gap, right? So you, will, you need to suck in the lubricant at the entry. So if you roll too fast, you turn too fast, there's not going to be enough oil supplied at the entry. Yes? And you can get what's called oil starvation, yes? where there's not enough oil being supplied at the entry, yes? and you get a collapse of the oil film, yes? Okay, and so H decreases suddenly, yes? And when H decreases, of course, we're going into boundary lubrication situ uh, situation, yes? Now, these things can happen, yes? And then suddenly, you find yourself with very little lubricant Yes, and you start making contacts between the two metal surfaces. Very high pressure contacts, and there's going to be shear forces. Shear, yes. So that's why we add these sulfur and phosphorus compounds, yes, to prevent welding, yes, at the surface. So when we have when you happen to have uh, boundary lubrication uh, problems, yes, and you will have those, for instance, when for some reason or another you have to go and work into low speed conditions or higher temperatures for some reason or high roughness, yes, your surface happens to be high roughness, yeah. Um, then we, we luckily have in 
the compounds of the uh, lubricant formulation, you have boundary films, phosphates and uh, sulfides, hmm? oxides and sulfides, at the surface. Hmm? So, um, so your boundary film, very close to the steel surface, is inorganic. Yes, and the oil is on top of that. That's how you, a good picture here. So when the oil film collapses, these two uh, inorganic compounds will uh, play a role. Hmm? So because you, they adhere to the steel surface, hmm? so they can easily shear, yes, and they have very high resistance against being squeezed out, yes, and they're very uh, pressure resistant. Yeah, and they, because they're there, they also... Uh, make it diff difficult for the two surfaces to cold weld to each other. Hmm? So that's why we have phosphates and sulfur. So, um, you know, the, the situation where the, uh, the, um, the conditions become bad in the, um, during rolling happens, for instance, when you have to reduce the velocity, yes? Uh, for instance, you're rolling and then you have to stop rolling because you, you, you finished the strip. The strip comes out of the, the mill. The, so the, you have to st uh, reduce the, um, the velocity, right? So, or when you're starting to roll, yes? You don't, you're not suddenly at very high uh, rolling speeds. You build up, right? So you start at low velocities. Yes. And so in these cases, you can, you can be in, um, in, in high friction conditions, okay? And this is one of the reasons why um, working continuously is so important. Yeah. So if you're asking yourself, why do we have a, uh, why do we put our um, pickling line, yes, and put it right into the, uh, the cold mill? That's because the cold mill then can work all the time, yes? You can just attach the coils after the other, and the cold mill never stops. So you never have these big speed variations, yes? So it's, it makes economic sense because you put things together and there's some equipment disappears. Uh, but it also makes uh, a sense from a product point of view to work in constant and continuous conditions. Hmm? Okay, so let's get back to our um, cold mill here. So when we start, we have, um, if it's a carbon steel, we have our grains here, yes. You pass through the cold rolling mill, so you, you basically have a plane strain deformation, which leads to a pronounced preferred orientations of all these grains. So you get these grains are now pancaked, yes, highly deformed. Deformations can be, as I said, 75%, 80%, so a lot more a lot larger than the deformation you give, for instance, in a tensile test, yes? And, and as a consequence, the orientation, crystallographic orientation distribution changes, yes? And in the case of carbon steels, yes, what we want to have in our product is what's called a very strong gamma fiber. We want to have all these little crystals we want them to have the 111 orientation parallel to the 111 direction parallel to the normal direction of the sheet. Yeah? Okay? And this is achieved by a combination of high levels of deformation and recrystallization annealing. Yeah? So the cold rolled material has a very high level of crystallographic uh, preferred orientation, but you cannot do anything with it because it's deformed, heavily deformed. It has no residual plasticity. So you need to do 
to anneal this, yes, and during the annealing process, you recreate uh, low defect density grains, yes, and um, a highly textured uh, microstructure with 111 parallel to normal direction being the preferred uh, orientation for the grains. Yes? And this situation gives you a high R value, so high plasticity, and a very low uh, planar anisotropy. So the R value doesn't change much in the function of direction in which it's tested. Okay? Now, the, the process of going from this to this, yes, is a kinetics process. It depends on time, it depends on temperature. It also depends on the amount of deformation you've given. Yes? So if typically if, you, if your deformation, your, the amount of deformation is uh, less than 50%, it's going to take a long time to recrystallize. Yes? And that's why in cold rolling, in cold deformation, we like to give large amounts of deformations because that will speed up the recrystallization. Why is that? Well, because the dislocation density here is the driving force for the recrystallization. The more I have deformed the material, the higher the driving force, the faster it will recrystallize. Okay, so there are two ways to recrystallize the steel product. You can do it by batch annealing. Yes, you basically take your coil of cold rolled material, you put it in a furnace for a long time, yes, and you let it recrystallize. This is a, a f one of these furnaces that's being opened. You can't see the coils. The coils are inside this, this, this uh, tube here. Yeah. That's where the furnace is. And this here is a continuous annealing furnace. There, you, instead of annealing the coil, you anneal the strip. Yeah. So you uncoil the strip, and you pass the strip through a furnace. Yes. So you see here... The strip, uh, I guess, coming out of or, or going into the furnace, I can't tell. Uh, the furnace is here, and this is an accumulator uh, where you um, store some um, few hundreds of meters of um, uncoiled strip. So let's start with the batch annealing furnace. Um, so in this furnace, let's have a look at, okay, so this is what they look like. In the interior, we stack the, um, the coils, yes? And we, and we uh, let gas flow through this, um, uh, the, the furnace. Yeah? We let, Okay, and it's protective gas. It's hydrogen-nitrogen mixture. And it's a protective atmosphere. So where do you do the heating? You do the heating on the outside of this furnace. Yeah, so there is this here. Yeah, that's where you have burners, yes? And so that will heat up the uh, interior wall of this uh, the furnace and, and this radiation heat will then heat up your, your coils. Let's see here. Okay, and this, this is what you see here. This is, uh, the, the, the coils are inside this, this furnace, and this is a cover, yes? The cover which contains the burners, okay? So you can have this, uh, uh, the amount of um, weight that you can anneal here is, for instance, of the order of 100, and 15, so that means there's quite a few coils can go, uh, be put in there on top of each other. Hmm? Um, height, uh, five meters, 
um, annealing capacity 2.7 tons per hour that's not very high so because the process is very slow you need many of these furnaces in parallel so if you visit a batch annealing uh, section of a cold rolling mill you will not see one furnace you'll see many furnaces yeah for instance uh, 47 furnaces and there may be more bases yes bases are these uh, these places on which you can put a furnace yes be why are there much much more bases than you have annealing hoods because you have to heat you only need the um, um, the hoods yes uh, when when you heat up yes so you when you cool down you just uh, don't need uh, this this cover here hmm? so capacity 80,000 tons per year surface cleanliness that's the, the the carbon residue that I talked about and the gas in for this particular picture here was hydrogen but in general it's hydrogen plus nitrogen and I will say something about the, the, the use of hydrogen and the heating itself is done by LPG or by electricity I'm seeing I'm over time here so I will, uh, I, will, I will stop at this point and we'll continue I guess we'll continue next week because Thursday is 1st of May Yes, and uh, I think we don't have class, right, on 1st of May. Okay, so we'll reconvene a week from now. You is next Tuesday a holiday? <laughs> I don't know. Is that a, no, but is it an official post tech day? I haven't heard about that. <laughs> is it official post tech day? Okay. Oh, it's, well then, uh, then I'm not going to say anything about this. Then. Right. So, so we'll, we will need to um, um, perhaps have um, a, uh, a makeup class or something. Okay. But so, well, then we, need, we meet next week on, on Thursday. Okay. Don't forget... Uh, that uh, there will be a, uh, a regular quiz. Right?